Everyone, welcome to DAO Basics. And of course, this is part of our series where we go through uh, everything relating to NFTs and how you can get involved, whether you're a creator or an investor. And today we have the lovely Elise Sue as our guest speaker. So would you, would you mind going to the next slide, Elise? Cool. So my name is Isabel and I am the program manager at Haymarket HQ. And of course, Elise here with me is the founding member of both Future Dow and Transhuman Coin. I'll let her do her own little introduction a little bit later, but she is a very impressive person who is very much in this space uh, and an expert on everything DAOs. All right. Next slide, please. And just a little bit about Haymarket HQ, if you don't know us already, uh, we are a co-working hub based in Sydney. Uh, and we are um, we create Web3 education for enthusiasts, whether you're a beginner or if you're already an intermediate or an advanced learner. Uh, and these include workshops like this um, program. And we've also got an advisory as well. So if you didn't catch me earlier, we are creating quite a few projects in the pipeline. If you'd like to sign up for early access, you can do so with the link in the chat. Uh, and of course, we are also very much um, a co-working hub in, oh, sorry, a co-working space based in Chinatown as well. So if you're ever in this neck of the woods, come up and say hi. We've got a bunch of tech startups here. A lot of them are doing very cool things in the global space. So they're going overseas and a lot of international companies are coming into Australia. They all live here. So come and say hi to us if you're ever in the Chinatown area. All right, might pass it on to Elise uh, for her wonderful presentation. So enough from me and over to you. Thanks, Isabel. So as Isabel said, my name is Elise Sue, and I'm involved in three main things. So the first is FutureDAO, which is, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, a bit later. And I'm also involved in Transhuman Coin, and I'm also a software engineer by trade and part of the UN AA Climate Change Committee. So I'm very passionate about impact projects and especially climate um, so the agenda for today is up on that slide, as you can see, and just a bit of a disclaimer. So before we go into the actual presentation, just want to remind, this is not investment advice. This just covers the basics. So some things might be simplified. I'm also not an expert, but I'm just sharing what I know or have learned as I go. And things change all the time. So what I say right now might not actually make that much sense, um, say tomorrow. And of course, please connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't already. I just want to give a shout out and say hi to everyone who has connected with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Discord. Um, just people who've said hi or just connected. I wish we could do a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but yeah, I'd love to just connect with you on LinkedIn or anywhere else if you'd like to continue the chat later. All right, so before we actually dive into what a DAO is, so let's talk about the origins, how it all started. So if we look at DAOs, which is an acronym for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. The concept of DAOs has actually been around for many years. It's probably as old as the concept of, of um, democracy. So it's actually just through the emergence of blockchain technology that we've been able to see the emergence and the, the rise of DAOs. So it was actually the, the, the actual term DAOs came about in 2013 when Vitalik, who's the Ethereum co-founder, wrote about them. And then a couple of years later, a group of people formed what was called the DAO. But it experienced a lot of technical and legal issues. So it actually got shut down. And then since then, every year or so, people have been declaring this is the year of the DAO. But, you know, where you get to see that. Maybe 2022 will be that. We'll see. So also, I just want to know if you have heard of DAOs before, if you know a little bit about DAOs, if you want to just pop into the chat a, a yes, then we, we can get, a I guess, a bit of a tally on who actually knows a bit about them already. All right. So what is a DAO? Why should you care about DAOs? Well, DAOs, like I said, are a decentralized autonomous organization. And I'm going to start with a little bit of a definition around it. So it's literally a community of people who have a shared mission. They work towards a common goal and then they pull funds and also do some sort of shared decision making. 
And in this case, what does the decentralized mean? It means that power is shared by all. And then the autonomous means that certain activities of that organization are executed algorithmically on a smart contract and they're recorded on a blockchain as an example. But why should you care about DAOs? Well, a lot of people say that they're the future of governance. They're the future of organizations. They might be the future of uh, venture capital, education, even work. So a lot of people are looking at use cases like maybe venture capital will be there, governing a country, for example, maybe even governing your strata building that you're living in, maybe even your book club. So there's lots to be excited about. Um, and a lot of people are actually jumping into this area to learn a bit more because it could actually be the future of how they work but, and how they organize themselves. And then I just want to go briefly into how do DAOs actually differ from a traditional organization, just to get a, a, a slightly better understanding of what a DAO is? So we actually look at a traditional organization and we look at this, um, this diagram, uh, that triangle that you see, that's representing that traditional organization where it has a really rigid structure. So usually you have a board, um, it's hierarchical. You have a board, you have exec team, you're going to have employees and then you're gonna have like shareholders. It's also quite competitive because people always talk about how can we move up the career ladder? There's also quite a bit of inequality in that. So for example, in terms of sharing the revenue, uh, as an employee, you might only be paid about 1%, uh, whereas the CEO might pay itself um, 20%. And also it's quite opaque. So you don't really see a lot of the goings on and the transactions that are happening in a traditional organization. And so that is... That in a nutshell is what a traditional organization is, but let's kind of put that aside, put aside what you love or hate about traditional organizations and then like get into a different mindset. And let's just look at, well, what is a DAO? How is it different from a traditional organization? So with a DAO, it's a lot more agile. It's um, you don't have these hierarchies. Everybody is a member. Everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets a say in the organization, uh, organizational activities. It's also a lot more collaborative. So you can be a mini CEO of your domain within that DAO. Um, and of course, in terms of diversity, it's when it comes to say getting rewarded for your work, it's not about, are you a better negotiator in terms of getting uh, what salary you're going to get? It's actually based on, you're gonna get rewarded based on the merit, your merit um, and based on the, what output you produce for the DAO. It's also a lot more transparent because everything is recorded on a blockchain and then you can see it uh, publicly. So I'm just looking through the chat and it looks pretty awesome that a lot of people have heard about DAOs or, or know quite a bit about them, which is really good to see. So if I move on to the next slide. So there are actually many types of DAOs um, on that DAO landscape, you can see that there's a number of them and they're, they're actually kind of outdated already. Actually, so if you have are uh, involved in any of these DAOs or if you've heard about them, maybe give me a give me a heart emoji just so I know how much you know about DAOs already. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit hard to kind of synthesize what, what DAOs, how can you categorize DAOs? So I like to kind of bucket them into three categories. So I like to put them into, think of it in terms of, well, does it allow you to invest? Um, does the DAO provide a service or product? Or is the DAO a social group? And of course, DAOs can be a combination of all those three things. And... Of course, oh, I see Darren. Darren is involved in one of those DAOs or may have heard about it. <laughs> That's good. So because this is uh, this event is part of the Haymarket HQ, and if 10,000 NFT Insights series events, we probably want to know a bit about, well, how do NFTs relate to DAOs? Well, you can use NFTs or otherwise known as non-fungible asset, um, tokens, sorry, non-fungible tokens, as a way to buy into a DAO. So the Nouns DAO is, uh, uses NFTs as a ticket into the DAO. So does the Board 8 Yacht Club. There's also DAOs which invest in NFTs. For example, Flamingo DAO and Pleaser DAO. 
But let's not kid ourselves. Every NFT project is a DAO because the new accepted definition of DAOs is that as long as ownership is recorded on blockchain, it's a DAO. Whether it's centralized and human governed, it doesn't matter. Now you could argue against that, but it is one of the new accepted definitions. All right, so how do DAOs work? At its most basic, a DAO is really simply two things. It's a way to vote on things and a way to pull funds together. So if you have a chat group like on Discord and maybe you have a crypto wallet where everyone is pulling money together, you already have a DAO. It's as simple as that. And so I'm going to go through a very high level example of how a DAO works. So let's take this um, fictitious shark DAO. Now you've heard some really good things about this shark DAO. And you've heard that what they do is that they acquire noun NFTs. You may have heard me refer to nouns before in a previous slide. So these nouns are particular NFT. You've always wanted a nouns NFT, but you can't afford it yourself. So you thought that maybe you can pull funds together with someone and then you can you know, get a hold of one of these NFTs for yourself. So how do you actually enter or be part of this shark DAO? Well, you've got to get some of these shark tokens. And in order to get these governance tokens, you have to transfer some ETH into the DAO. And then in return, you get some of these shark governance tokens. And then you're part of this DAO. You're one of these sharks that you see on the diagram. And you get to have a piece of that nouns NFT. So I just... I just wanted to now do a little bit more of a deep dive into the key components of a DAO. So there's about five key components up there. And if we start with the very first one, which is the charter or the bylaws. Um, so as I'm actually going through all, the, all of these components, I'm going to quickly refer to what is different from a traditional organization. So with a charter or bylaws, they can be algorithms, they can, they can be smart contracts, but they can also just be a document that lives on your Google Drive. So this charter or bylaw should usually include your mission. So what the DAO does should also include your governance process, how you decide on things as an organization, should also include your community rules and conflict resolution. Uh, whereas in a traditional organization, you probably have, say, a processes and procedures manual, and that's probably kind of handed down from the exec team. And then, of course, you have this board, which provides governance oversight. Now, the second component is governance process. So the governance process is really um, how do you decide on things that happen in the DAO? And as part of it, you would look at what type of voting system we have? For example, are you going to allow everybody to vote? Are you going to allow people to delegate their votes? You're also going to have this, um, the process which covers what you do operationally, but also as a business. Um, if you compare it to a traditional organization, you would probably only have shareholders that vote. And of course, in, in a DAO, everybody, everybody gets a, a vote or they should have a say at least um, because everyone will have you know a way to to um, provide input on how the DAOs run but in a, tr a traditional organization as an employee you probably don't actually get any say or vote into what the operational or business processes and activities are going to be like and of course this third component which is the governance tokens or whitelisting so that is required in, um, in order to enable people to participate in the governance process. Um, so, so it gives you a right to vote. Um, you don't really always need governance tokens. So you might just get whitelisted to vote instead. Traditional organizations, you probably just have some sort of share certificate and you'll attend an AGM and, and yeah, you'll, you'll vote on certain things. Um, then we move up to the fourth component, which is roles and functions. So roles and functions, they can actually be done algorithmic, algorithmically using smart contracts, or they can be carried out by humans in a DAO. And usually you would have these type of roles or functions, including community, treasury, development, really depends on what type of DAO you are. 
in a traditional organization, there's probably less, less um, emphasis on community, but more on users. So you're probably going to, or, or even employees, so you're going to have HR marketing PR teams instead, and they're very much done by humans. And then the fifth and the very last component, which is incentive design, is really about how will you reward people who contribute to the DAO, who do work for the DAO? And usually in a DAO, you would look at using bounties, grants, and salaries to do it. And it's, it's a lot more equitable way in, in terms of getting people to be rewarded for the work. So anyone can just pitch in. Uh, usually in traditional organization, you'll just be paid salaries or wages and, and you'll be paid the same regardless of whether you actually produce any output that week or that month in a lot of cases. And of course, if you have any questions throughout this whole presentation, just pop it into the chat and I might even just start answering them as we go, or you could just pop in the questions and then we'll answer them in the, at the end. Okay, so I covered a little bit about the benefits of DAOs in the beginning, but the other ones include experimenting with different, different democratic models. So we're giving power to individuals to vote. It's also more inclusive. So a lot of these DAOs are permissionless. Anyone can be part of a DAO just by buying their token, which allows you to uh, see the activities of the DAO and also to vote on DAO operations. It's also a more equitable distribution of equity. So fairness for founders and members. Uh, for example, traditionally you might have a 70-30 split um, for founders, but it might be flipped in a DAO. And then you have decentralized leadership. So there's no single point of failure. If you can think of any other benefits that I've missed in terms of DAOs, feel free to pop it in the chat. I'd love to see what you think. But it's not all good. It's not all just benefits with DAOs. There are also risks on the other hand. And I'm going to go through four case studies of recent things that have gone wrong with DAOs. So the first one is members might vote to liquidate you and basically just shut down your DAO. That happened with Ape DAO. So this DAO has a public token called Ape and the price of that token did not reflect the underlying assets of the DAO. They, they invested in a lot of Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs and also others. And so they voted to liquidate. Um, and I think they might still be liquidating at the moment. The second risk is anonymity. You don't know who you're dealing with. This actually happened in Wonderland DAO. A convicted felon was actually looking after their treasury. And when it was discovered who he was, all hell broke loose. And, um, and then I, I, their price actually never really recovered. And then the, four, the third one is legal uncertainty. So we saw that with the DAO, which was mentioned briefly at the very beginning. So there's no really specific DAO laws or legal entities um, that uh, are around DAOs, although Wyoming and also the Marshall Islands has actually come up with some sort of like legal entity that they think will fit a DAO, although a lot of uh, critics do argue that these ones still do have some issues. Um, but there is a lot of legal uncertainty, even though we can actually look at what is the existing regulation and how does it apply to DAOs, such as securities law, uh, company law. Um, and it, it was actually legal uncertainty that, that um, resulted in the DAO shutting down um, among technical and other issues as well. And then you also have bad actors, people who attempt to take over your DAO. That happened with the Build Finance DAO, where someone just came in and just um, basically cleaned up, cleaned out their treasury, minted themselves a whole bunch of tokens. I think they had like a billion, billion dollar treasury or something. So it was quite significant. And we've also seen the rise of authoritarian DAOs. <laughs> if you've seen the debacle with Wonderland, you may have seen this already. So this here is a post on Discord that I screenshotted. It's by Daniel Sester, who is the founder of Wonderland. So after it was found out that, you know, the whole convicted felon thing, he said, 
this DAO is going to be managed now by me directly. Yeah, so I'm not sure that really works in a DAO. That's not really how DAOs uh, operate. But it might interest the supreme leader of the Kimmy's NFT, which you may have heard about if you attended the last talk on NFTs by Juco. This is a joke. Um, the, the, so how can you participate in a DAO? Well, I've just outlined a couple of steps which kind of break down, you know, how can you just like get started? And, and the best way to learn about them is to participate in one. So first you can find a DAO that interests you. You can go on to DeepDAO. It's a platform which does analytics on DAOs. Um, so you can find out some of the data around it, but also find some DAO that might interest you personally. Then you can go on to some crypto exchange like Binance and buy their DAO token or even Uniswap, um, the decentralized exchange. Then you might want to jump into their community channel like Discord or Telegram and then read up on what they're actually doing. They don't usually keep their website or anything up to date. Usually you really just have to go into Discord and find out what they're doing at the moment. And then the fifth one is put your hand up for things, like participate in discussions. The best way to feel like you're actually part of a DAO is actually to start doing things. And then you can go into their governance section of their platform and you can start reading some proposals. Once you're comfortable with that, you might want to start voting on some of these proposals. And then once you're really familiar or comfortable, you can consider working for the DAO. Is anyone actually thinking about working for a DAO after this or, or not just working for a DAO, just participating in a DAO? Or maybe you already are part of a DAO or you're making one exploring the idea, already doing it. Nice one. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thanks for sharing the link. Oh, yes. Part of one to learn more. Oh, nice. Excellent. Okay. So I can't recommend any specific DAOs, but I can talk about some of the ones that I'm involved in. So as I mentioned before, I'm involved in two main Web3 projects. And one of them is Transhuman Coin. I'm a founding member of Transhuman Coin. It is a community token and it's for our 2 million transhumanists around the world uh, so that we can use science and technology to overcome the limitations of human biology. And one of the cool projects that we're doing right now is we're working with the South African Medical Research Council, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we're working with them to put health data onto NFTs. And we're also a charity token as well. So we donate some of, um, I guess, we, we have this donation wallet or fund that we build up and then we select things that we can uh, donate to. So this is where the DAO comes in. So it's not really a full DAO. We only open it to our top investors and also our very, very committed um, uh, community members. So they can go in and they can do proposals on who we should donate to next, what type of project that we should work on. You can check out more and find out more about us on this link, transhumancoin.finance. And then the second project that I'm also a founding member of is FutureDAO. So we're a community that invests in and supports Web3 projects, which have positive and radical impact. And we do have a website and Discord. Um, so you can check out futuredao.xyz. We are a permissioned DAO. So you do have to apply to be a member but you, everyone is welcome to be part of the Discord community and we welcome everyone to be part of it. We love hearing about any projects that you're working on or even if you just want to find out more about Web3 and impact, um, that would be incredible if you want to join our community. And then what if you want to launch a DAO? So there are DAO as a service platforms like Aragon and DAO House. This this logo isn't very clear, uh, but it's just D-A-O-H-A-U-S. 
these are quite, um, they're like an all-in-one platform to help you launch tokens, do your voting and all the other things related to DAOs. There's also some DAO composable tools, which are like Lego blocks. They can just piece together. And the very popular ones that people use are Snapshot and Gnosis. Or if you want to get a little bit more guidance on how to set up your own DAO, I do recommend a course by the web3academy.co. They do an amazing how to create your own DAO course if you want to check them out at this website. Cool. I guess we've reached the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Elise. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I do done. want to, I do want to actually just um I, I put in some Easter eggs into this whole presentation. So if anyone can at, uh, if anyone can recognize at least three NFT projects that I've put into the slides. And if you just pop it into the chat, then I'll, I'll know who was actually paying attention. <laughs> I love it. I love that. A little challenge for you guys who um, are watching the presentation with us. Uh, hopefully you don't cheat and go watch the recording afterwards, but it'll be fun. Um, and anyways, uh, just a quick one. Speaking of uh, courses to learn about NFTs, uh, we've got quite a few in the pipeline as well. One to develop your own NFT collection, as well as how to build your own NFT investment strategy. So if you'd like to join the waitlist, please just scan the QR code or type in the link down below and drop your name into the form. Now we've come to um, the exciting part of the presentation, which is the q and I already saw a few people add their questions in, so I'll try and bring that up. Of course, uh, the chat is open for questions, so I'll be asking Elise, um, I'll be reading them out for you. Uh, so one question that came up earlier was from Kristen, I believe, and she says, what is your view on not-for-profits moving to this model? Oh, yeah, I think it's perfect. Um, so as long as you have very engaged people who are willing to, you know, make suggestions, vote on these suggestions, um, be very involved, then yes, for sure. Um, Not-for-profit DAOs are actually probably legally easier to create than, than profit ones. Um, but yeah, hit, hit me up if I can do a general chat, um, not, not really professional advice, but yeah, happy to just chat on LinkedIn if you want to connect. Great. Uh, someone else asked, what is the best way to meet potential DAO co-founders? Oh, super interesting. I'm going to share the story about Future DAO. So we started as a very organic community. Um, I, I actually was in a uh, chat group on Telegram with a bunch of people. And then we started talking about, hey, let's do a DAO. I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do a DAO. And then I, I was like, okay, well, somebody needs to be an instigator. So I created Discord, got a bunch of people in. Um, and then we, we kind of discuss things around impact because that was a core theme that we, we were all interested in. And the funny thing is, not many, well, actually no one from that original group is now an active member of the DAO, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, I didn't really, so anyone who's actually quite active in the DAO now and who is a core member is, it was all done organically. I just got a bunch of people together and I saw who were the core contributors and, you know, because they were already contributing so much, um, might as well make them a core member so they could continue doing the things that they're already doing. So you don't have to think about how you're going to find, you know, co-founders or core team members. Um, just get a community together, see who you work well with, who's actually contributing. I think that's actually a cool way to start. Although you could just get a bunch of friends together. Yeah, awesome. Um, Mark here asks, if people want to learn by watching or listening, do you have any favorite shows or podcasts that you might recommend? Ah, yes, yes. Well, there's a new one coming out um, very soon. I can see a couple of people on this call. So Kat, Dan, there's Mark, Arturo. Um, so join the, join the Oz DeFi uh, association. Sorry if I'm misquoting the name of the group, but I believe Mark actually put the link in the chat. Um, it's a really cool group and we do have a, uh, a podcast coming out. Also, the other ones I like is, um, what's his name? The, the Pomp, the Anthony Pompliano, uh, the Pomp podcast is a bit of a, a, a BTC maxi, uh, but yeah, I think he has good content. I also like 
the Casey crypto, I think it's crypto Casey, really good intro to, to the basics of crypto and Web3. And I also like the Bankless podcast. Yeah, nice. Some good recommendations. I believe Adriana um, uh, also has a podcast as well. Uh, and she interviews quite a few Australian uh, experts in this field. So check that one out as well. Um, let's see. Exactly. How could I forget that? That's actually <laughs> one of my favorite. Yeah. Adriana Bellotti is her name, I believe. Uh, let's see. Someone has asked, oh, please go on. Are all DAOs exercised on Discord? It's very popular. Um, usually a lot of Web3 communities, so DeFi, NFT, DAO communities, they, they need a way to chat. And Discord is just a it's a better, well, I hate saying better because it's kind of hard to get yourself immersed in a DAO, uh, I mean, sorry, Discord server. Uh, but yes, it, Discord is one of the main areas that people build um, communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got one from Arturo who says, uh, what is your view of regulation of DAOs uh, in the context of creating a legal identity to DAOs? Hopefully I got that, that question. Correct. Uh, view on regulation of DAOs, uh, a, a lot needs to be done. So in Australia, um, I, I believe that the Senate, uh, the Senate's hearing committee, sorry, I'm, I'm misquoting here, but um, there, there is a, there, there is a committee that's working with the Senate in terms of regulations around DAOs. So some of the things that they did point out or, or did uh, list out is that they should be a flow through entity, for example, in terms of like taxation, um, there should be limited liability for members. There should be a way for people to get in easily um, and out of DAOs as is the nature of DAOs. These are just listing a couple of these examples. I believe we do need regulation around DAOs because currently anything that's unincorporated is technically a partnership which leaves you open to um, liability. So I, I think it's very important. There's not really, right now, any, any legal entity people are looking at, people are just kind of retrofitting a DAO into an existing legal structure, which does not fit all the time. Right. I think as with most um, things concerning crypto or NFTs, the space is constantly changing um, and evolving very fast and everyone's trying to catch up. So uh, check, uh, keep your eyes on the space. Uh, I've got one from Jordan. Could you talk a little bit more about how DAOs remunerate the contributors, the form, method of payment and challenges, if any, DAOs experience in this area? Mm. So I briefly mentioned some forms of remuneration, which include bounties, grants, and traditional salaries. So the it's in DAOs, they're meant to be a little bit more equitable in that you, you get rewarded based on merit and what you contribute. And there's ways to track your contribution. There's a lot of tools. So, so tools to, to track contribution in DAOs is actually, I would say it's more mature than expected. There's so many out there. So it allows you to actually, yeah, track how, how is that person performing? Are they providing a lot of value? And should I be rewarding them for it? Um, I, yeah, I suppose like there's a lot of people just work for kudos in a DAO as well. They just really love the community aspect, um, but for, for long-term sustainability, it is important to look at, I guess, what they call incentive design. How do you remunerate people? Cool. Uh, Derek asks, what are the most important skills that a founding member of a DAO should collectively possess? So maybe something you can draw from your experience as well. Community, community management. Yeah, it's all about that. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, I think it's like across all Web3, you, it's really about community building that up. So like before you do NFT drop, you should probably build up your community first. In a DAO, that's also the same case, build up your community before you launch it. Um, yeah, it's like, it's sort of like a mix of like people management, um, people management, marketing, and yeah, just a whole bunch of stuff. 
Uh, and then just on that question, do you maybe have top sort of three tips you could give when it comes to building a community? Uh, yeah, one is onboarding. So a lot of people say Discord is actually quite complex to um, get your head around. Like it's very hard to just get immersed once you first join a Discord server. There's just so much going on. Um, so always think about your onboarding experience. I think I, I don't do it well at the moment. So yeah, I, I have a lot to learn as well, but that's very critical onboarding. Um, it's like the UX UI element of that. And, and Discord already has very horrible UX UI. The second is being able to, uh, I guess, think about, think about different levels of how community members can contribute. So there's probably some people who are, there's going to be a lot of passive members. That's totally fine. But there's probably some people who want to do a bit more and some, some people who want to do a lot more. So you're going to think about what are the different levels of contribution um, you can allow uh, members to participate in. So, for example, maybe some people want to become a core member. So you allow a pathway to that. Or maybe some people just want to get involved every now and then, like, say, write an article for you. And so you just provide a pathway to do that. The third one is, um, I suppose it's, yeah, it, it's about how can you empower your community to work for you? So uh, I can use my own example, I suppose, in Transhuman Coin. So we've got about 21,000 members in our Telegram channel. And, and it's, it's incredible how this organic uh, THC collective, we call it. It's like the equivalent of, you know, the Shiba Inu army. Um, literally a bunch of really dedicated, committed, committed community members, and we don't remunerate them for it. They actually take it on themselves to form this group and they go out and shill um, and they go out and promote transhuman coin. And it's actually through the skill of a very um, good community manager who are worth their weight in gold in being able to kind of help coordinate that and, and help facilitate that. And that's like, that's beautiful. That's exactly what you want in a community. Yeah, fantastic tips. And I, I agree with you that the UI uh, UX of Discord is very disconcerting at first, but so the onboarding process is definitely very much important, uh, especially to a lot of people who are just um, starting on this journey who have no idea how to use it. Um, We've got another question here. How does fundraising happen in a DAO and why would someone from the outside community want to fund a DAO, i.e. what is in it for them? Ah, yeah, so I suppose there's permissioned and uh, permissionless DAOs, so private and public DAOs. So in a, in a private DAO, you would just get members to you know, contribute their own capital and then they can become a member um, and that will um, give them voting rights. And in a public DAO, it's you can do you, you can do public tokens. Um, so these are like governance tokens to become part of your DAO. And they can be speculative. It does attract a couple of uh, speculators and, why would they want to be part of it? Because of probably the price action that they're betting on. Uh, but also, but also there's a lot of people who believe in the DAO and what they're what they're trying to achieve, the product that they're going to build, the protocol that they're going to build, and they want to support it. They want to be part of navigating the, the journey uh, or what the protocol actually ends up looking like. They may actually want to even um, work for the DAO. So first they might just become a member they get to vote on things and eventually they want to become more immersed and help build that protocol. Great, thanks for that. Uh, I'm wondering if I missed anyone's questions and if I did, please drop them in the chat again. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Or feel free to turn on your mic and ask them directly, that's all right too. Oh, we've got one from Christine. What would be the future opportunity slash implementations of DAO? I mentioned before uh, governing a country, for example. So it's a different different um, model of democracy that we could use. Um, it would also be a lot of venture capital. Um, also, that is a very popular popular use case. 
it's yeah basically strata management anything which requires a democratic vote or which a democratic vote would be uh fitted for that's um yeah that's the future opportunities also in terms of d democratizing access to something um and and allowing better equitable ownership in something so it actually applies to absolutely everything um including say uh, a university even you could actually turn that into a uh, member owned university you the members both provide the content but they also the consumers of that educational content yeah awesome um are there any last questions all right Okay, well, if anyone thinks of anything, please pop them in the chat. Otherwise, I think we've had a great session today. Um, I think it uh, goes without saying that even I learned so much about DAOs and the uh, real use cases that we can take on into the future. Um, again, if you'd like to connect, uh, connect with Ali, uh, Elise, sorry, if you'd like to connect with Elise, uh, you can do so via her LinkedIn, or you can give FutureDAO or Transhuman Coin a uh, Google. Um, if you'd like to know more about Haymarket HQ and what we do, or if you'd like to join some of our future programs, please uh, check out our early bird waitlist. Uh, and if I could get you to go to the next slide. Thank you. We've actually got a event coming up in two weeks in this exact same time slot for the next one in the series. So this one is all going to be about NFT investing 101. So if you're not a creative person or if you feel like you're not really, um, if making a collection, uh, NFT collection is not for you and you just want to invest in whether it's just um, assets or collections or uh, infrastructure around NFTs, this one will be a great breakdown of that. So this will be on March 15, five to six. Uh, there's the link below, or you can go onto our socials and find us on Eventbrite. Uh, and yeah, we'll see you then, hopefully. And of course, 